Hi, my name is Konstantin Magnus. In this Houdini tutorial, we are going to create three-dimensional knitting patterns on top of a mesh surface based on the UV coordinates. As per usual, you can download the file on the Procygen website along with a description of how it's done. And you can also support my work on Patreon if you like. Now, before we start from scratch, let's have a look at the setup so it all started with creating a single element based on a circle arc which is then scaled or shaped using a channel ramp curve and it's also bent to make it interlock with the next row. You can see all the grid rows here and we are simply looking up the position of uh, this element and repeat it. After that, we apply colors based on rows and columns and then assign it to the surface, at least to the rest position here. So we clip off the parts behind the seams and apply it to the pick hat like so. All right, um, we will now look into how this is done from scratch using a new Houdini scene. I just laid out some notes here for myself, but in general, we can start with a circle set to open arc, um, set it to minus 250, 50, or rather, I think the other way around, minus 50, 230, like so, and give it a bit of resolution. Now, in order to make sure it sits on the ground, we can justify Y min and scale it along Y to one. The reason we're doing this is we want to use world space to control the deformation. So let's call this wrangle shape. And we will multiply on X. So if we multiply it by two, it gets wider. If we multiply it by 0.5, it gets more narrow. Of course, we are going to use a channel ramp for that. Let's call it shape and make it run along the Y component of the position. Just click here on the bottom and you can see that we can now define, maybe using a bilinear interpolation, how wide or narrow it should be shaped. We can still adjust this later, but one thing we should make sure is to bring the first two and the last two points down. So you can either use a bit of code or you can hard code it. If you know that you have set the divisions to 32, it is also safe to say zero and one, 31 and 32 will be scaled down along Y. That way I can resample the curves afterwards set to subdivision curves and give them a fair bit of resolution here because I'm not going to copy all these points later. I'm just going to look them up. So this should be rather cheap. Let's uh, bend it now backwards. So I can call this wrangle bend and now define V at PZ based on a cosine along v at p dot y again, multiplied by capital pi times two. And this is quite extreme now, but you can see this should be looping. And for visual reasons, we can also scale it down to 0.1. Now let's next integrate this into a grid of rows. So first we would need to change the orientation to x, y and switch over to rows. Now the number of columns effectively defines the resolution. I'm going to set this to 500 for now and start off with maybe 25 rows. I do not need to care about the size of the grid because I'm going to use the rel relative bounding box later on anyways. Now comes the more interesting part. It's about integrating the single loop to the grid. So just like in handwriting, we're going to look up the position of the loop each time. So we want to know 
the world position of this loop and bring it here to a pivot we define multiple times on each line. So let's start to integrate this. You can see the code here. We first of all define a number of copies. That's an integer value. And we can just call the variable C. And as we are here, we can also define a variable S for the scale. Now let's blow the scale up and define maybe 25 copies. Now in the first paragraph, we're going to look up the position on the single element. And in the second paragraph, we're going to look up the pivot positions on our own grid. So let's start with looking up the element. Using the vert vertex curve param function, we can simply get a variable that starts here with zero and goes up to 1.0 on the end of the curve. We can integrate this into a vector where we have u and two zeros. And let's just, to make sure, let's assign this to the color attribute so we can see the x component now ranges from zero to one. Now, in order to look up the positions, we are going to use the primuv function on the second input. We want to know the world position on the one curve that is there, named zero, and we are going to look up the position based on the uvw we have just created. Now, what we should get when we assign this to our position vector is loads of grids set to the exact same location as our single element. Now, what we would like to have is, of course, a function to scale it. Let's cast it to a vector and bring in the scale slider. And now we should want to place this onto the grid. So we're after the pivot position. I'm going to use a second u called u underscore two. And what we're essentially doing to get this stepped here, here and there and not float everywhere, we will uh, first of all use the floor function of u multiplied by the number of copies and divided by the number of copies. Now in order to offset it, we are going to add u divided by c to it. Now that should be enough for our new uvw underscore two vector, which is composed of u underscore two and two zeros. Next, let's look up our pivot position. Again, using primuv, but this time on our own geometry stream, we want to know the position on this very primitive number and we feed in uvw underscore two. Now let's move the position to the pivot by subtracting, subtracting minus pivot and assign this to the position. So let me just demonstrate this. This would be the scale and this would be the number of copies. So if we crank up the copies, we should see this. And it seems I've missed something somewhere, which could be not the scale. Oh, yeah, of course, I missed it up there. It's not you we are going to use, but we just want a fraction of it. So the fraction of u multiplied by the number of copies is what we're working with to, to make it repeat. So now you can see we have these little loops integrated here and the scale slider can make it intersect like so. And we should also think about scaling the width 
of these elements a bit more, maybe like this. Now you should see this has worked. We still need to uh, maybe change the resolution a bit. I'll come up with a thousand points for each grid, but that would be it. And one more thing while we're here is we should define the index, which is basically a number for each element, which can be yeah, simply, again, be the floor of u multiplied by the number of copies. If you want a quick check on this, let's create a random color for each index, like so, and now you should have a unique color for each element. All right, I'm not going to use the color now because I create these colors in a separate wrangle, which can be called color accordingly, and we would need two or rather three parameters. First of all, we want an integer with a seed number, and then we want to define the repetitions so how often we use the same color, and then we would like to define the total number of colors. So let's just call this colors. All right, this would be three, the three parameters, just dial in something to get started. And now we would like to, again, use a simple example, VHCD, and we want a random, color for each primitive number and each index. So this is totally random now for each element. But if you want a more controlled pattern, then let's start with vector A and B, which would be a random vector based on the primitive number for A, divided by the repetitions. And we're going to use a modulo, a modulo called num, which is the number when it should repeat. So it starts over from zero and we feed in our seed value. Vector B would be another random vector, this time based on an integer of, uh, named index divided by two. So this would repeat as well. And I hard coded a modulo of four in this case, but you can play around with all these numbers, of course. And again, we're going to use a seed. Now, in order to mix these colors, we can start off with the minimum function, which would just return the minimum component of A and B, which looks like this here. So you can see we get some repetitions, like so. And um, in order to make this a bit more contrasty, I divide it by the maximum component of A and B. So you see this has a bit of a more a bright look and we can also affect this using a power function. I've chosen 0.5 for this to get a bit more contrast back. Now, of course, this is very dependent on the seed value we've, we've, chosen, we've chosen and all these numbers can be changed. Now that would be the colors. Now comes the last part, which is we are going to project this on a mesh with UV coordinates. I'm using the pick head and subdivide it two times. You can make sure your mesh has UV coordinates by pressing spacebar five or inspecting them here in the geometry spreadsheet. Now, in order to um, make our grid apply to the mesh, we should first of all maybe increase the number of rows to, let's say, 300. Define the number of copies here and scale them down. Just make sure it stays in proportion and you provide enough resolution here in terms of uh, colors, uh, columns. So on my side, this is working again. Play with the scale, with the number of copies, and with the grid's resolution. Now, let's screen it or uh, assign it to 
a surface and this is um, done by using the bounding box. It's looking up the UV coordinates and or rather the distance to it and then we're going to ask for the position on the surface and the normal and then all this is combined into a rest attribute and we are going to uh, assign the distance to this to these uv islands so when we are somewhere here the distance would be uh, assigned to the y of the height you will see while we do that in a bit so let's just start off with the bounding box relative bounding box on the geometry stream we provide the world position we are going to set d to the bbz which is the depth of our pattern like this the bending and then we are going to set bbz on our side to zero this is just so we have a clean lookup of the uv coordinates I provide an empty variable called prim and an empty vector called uvw and I want to know how far away the, uh, the bounding box is or the flattened bounding box I should say from the uvs of the mesh. So let's just uh, visualize this real quick. I now it claims that BBX wasn't closed, but now it should tell me which primitive has been found on which uh, coordinate. That would be UVW, and then I should also see the distance. We can quickly visualize this by assigning it again to the CD, so let's ramp this up quite a bit. So you should see the underlying UV coordinates. It's of course zero when the bounding box information lies directly on the UV islands, but the further it gets away from the boundaries of the UV islands, you see it fades out like this. And we use this information to clip off all these parts we don't need because otherwise they would be lying on the seams. All right, so let's uh, get some more information based on what we have. We want to know the position on the primitive that has been found at the UV location. So you can imagine here, this is the pig hat and we want to, based on the UV coordinate, we have found, uh, we want to know where this position is and where the normal points out to. So let's just copy this line and rename the position to NML for normal and read in capital N. To make this waterproof, we will calculate the normal beforehand and it's not necessary, but we can set the normals to position. Now let's see what happens when I set VHP directly to pause, then we should get this. You can see also the problem. These are the parts that are not lying directly onto a UV island. But let's just ignore this for now and add the normal and multiply it by a very small number such as 0 0.005. So that way um, this would be blown up again D, by the way, would be integrated to restore the depth. So you should see a bit of a change. The curves now go in and out from the surface because we captured D, which was the depth of the flat pattern here, this one. All right, this is basically what we need, but I cannot really work with uh, three-dimensional curves as nicely, so I want to store them as a rest position for now. And I rather would like to have the distance to the UV boundaries 
on my world position because then I can clip them using the clip node. So now you can see this three-dimensional, or let's rather say 2D representation almost. Um, and I subtracted a very small number, 1e minus 5, so that I can now clip it away. So I should get rid of the spaces I do not need because they are not lying on a UV island and then use the rest position to extract it and restore it. So now you can see I cut away the wrong part. I need to keep the primitives below the plane. And now you can zoom in closely and see whether it worked. There should not be any leftovers along the seams. You shouldn't see a line there. And this is basically how I apply this pattern. Now, of course, we can do various things. You can now set a P scale to a very small number and send this to your render engine. Like so. Or you could play with using the sweep node for a bit more complexity, we would then create a, uh, let's just set the radius to one because it's reading in the P scale, I assume. And it also, if it's still messing this up a bit, then we could think about uh, using various, uh, uh, or remove the normals and these things, they may also have an effect. So normal is something we should avoid. P scale depends on what we do. Now they should get really, really big uh, in terms of radius, but this is basically the gist of how this is done. What I will use the sweep node for is um, basically to rotate these lines. Let me just switch over to the other file. Um, you can see the same thing in action here. Um, this would be just the sweep. But we can also uh, set this to just being rows or columns, so that way I see the actual um, the actual chords here, and I can also use the rotation, let's say full twists, and then you see that now all these uh, yawns are twisted. And then if I didn't crash the other, Houdini session, we may also have enough time to create some uh, tubes again based on these curves. So let's just see this. They should, of course, be very, very small. And that way we would see uh, what. Yeah, that's exactly the, the shape I was after. So you can now define with the first sweep, you would define the overall width, and this would be the second radius for the smaller chords. All right, thank you for watching.